PK-52, the Saturday morning meeting. Well, things are starting to move a little bit in the United States right now. Um, a lot of stuff has happened politically over the last 30 days. Um, and the industries are starting to grow. Some of you guys haven't been around in the car business for 30 years, and I, and I do understand some of the things that are happening right now in the car business are new to you, uh, but they've happened before. So let's talk about it. Back in the 90s, we had a merge of the dot-com industry. Um, everything went um, digital, and the world started to change. People were jumping out of jobs that they'd had for years, uh, good-paying jobs, good benefits, to take a bite of the dot-com industry. They were luring people in with luxury um, demos, so people were having, uh, you know, they were getting BMWs to, as a signing bonus, and California in the Silicon Valley went bananas. As this started to happen, the cost of doing business went up. Uh, money went up. The, the cost of, of, of borrowing money at the bank went up. And people were looking to buy new cars, and the price of new cars went up. The technology was starting to grow in cars, and they were finding out that if you just simply did the math, and I'm talking about just a basic solar calculator. I like, you know, solar. Don't have to plug it in. Walk outside if it's not working and take $30,000 divided by 60 months and you come up with a $500 payment. That was stunning to people who wanted to be at $250 a month. You know, I started in the industry in the 80s. People wanted to be at $250 a month and I'll be, I, you go into a dealership today and the first thing out of a customer's mouth is, hey, yeah, I want to be around $250 a month. And so, you know, if you look at 30 years have passed and people still want to be at the same monthly payment, monthly payment becomes important. So a couple of things start to happen when the industry starts to evolve. As money gets more expensive, people do one of two things. They either keep their car longer and take their car into service, or they start considering um, how to decrease the overall cost to buy a car so used cars and leasing come back into play. If you look at the luxury manufacturers, luxury, luxury manufacturers um, lease at above 80%. So the people that, I guess, if you look, look at the news, that have all the money in the world, that don't pay enough taxes, um, why do they lease cars? If they've got a giant business and it's super profitable and everything, obviously they could just pay cash for a car. They certainly could uh, finance a car, and, and the interest rates have been super low, and some manufacturers have been doing zero for 72 months for as long as I remember, but they still choose to lease a car. So why do the people, with all the money in the world, quotes, all the money in the world, choose to lease? And why do people that struggle to pay their electric bill and their house rental or mortgage payment every single month refuse to lease? So you've got to look at who has the money, how do they manage their money, and which pathways do they choose? And you've got to say, how do they retain their money and their wealth if they're doing something that mainstream doesn't do? So leasing is going to come back into play as, as we move forward. The car industry is changing. You know, to, I don't know how many times Toyota has to tell you that they're no longer a car business, they're a mobility business. I posted some stuff on Twitter and Facebook the other day where Toyota's considering putting a rover on the moon. Uh, we're building robotics. We're building self-driving cars. We've built a phenomenal hydrogen car. Um, unfortunately, you can't fill the car up across America, so the Mirai is kind of dead in the water because of the ability to fuel the car, not because the car doesn't perform well. The par car performs fantastic. And if you live out in San Francisco and the California areas right now, um, you know there's some used car Mirai leases that are phenomenal. How about leasing a car, getting a super low payment, and getting $15,000 worth of free fuel? So there's a lot of change going on in the car business, and it's going to come fast, and it's going to come furious, but it's going to come at a price tag. As interest rates go up and the cost of borrowing money goes up, then even the cars at the same price they were last year become unaffordable to some of our buyers. So leasing will come back into play. So I'm going to put a couple of uh, just a, a pearls out there for you. You know, why do I lease? Why do I consider a lease? I go in to buy a pre-owned car. It's a pre-owned car world right now. 
Um, used cars are selling at a premium. I mean, used cars are selling at a premium. So I go look at a new car, can't afford a new car. I look at a, a, a Toyota pre-owned car and they're selling for almost as much as a new car. So I really want to replace the car I have right now. It's a good time to trade my car because used car values are up. Um, I just don't know which way to go. So if I lease the car, the least of the benefits, and I'm saying the least of the benefit, is my payments lower. Um, that's where customers really focus. That's their number one objective to get their payment as low as possible. After that, I don't know that they really understand the value of a lease. But even if I reduce my payment by $100 a month, and, I, and my term of my lease is only 36 months. That means there's $3,600 $3, in my checking account, bank account, uh, my e-bank account that I didn't spend. So even if I turn the car in at the end of three years, just give the car back to the bank, give the car back to TFS, I'm $3,600 better off. Let me leave that out there for a second. I don't want anybody to be confused. I'm not making this up. This is not magic. If I drove a car for three years and I spent $3,600 less to drive the car, I still have the $3,600. How often do you find that a customer trading a three-year-old car in has $3,600 worth of equity at trade? If they've got $3,600 worth of equity, they probably put four grand down on their retail note to buy their payments down. So they don't have $3,600 worth of equity. They have minus $400 worth of equity because they put $4,000 cash down in order to buy their payments. So one of the first things I've always done as a sales professional or a manager is I ask the customer, do you have the original paperwork that you did on this car? Crazy enough, a lot of customers still have it in their center console or their glove compartment. I'm looking at that and I see that, okay, here's where we are on the car deal. Uh, you have a little equity in your trade, but remember you put $4,000 down, you have $1,000 worth of equity, so you're really behind $3,000. If you would have leased last time and lowered your payment $100, um, you wouldn't have had to put any money down and you'd be $3,600 better off. So if I could make that statement, then we're almost $8,000 better off. Um, that's the way I would start with the customer. Too many times a customer comes in and says, hey, I leased last time, I want to buy this time. Well, before we say, okay, say, well, let's look at the best way and the best options for you. You've already decided to get a car, so that's out of the way. We're going to get you a car. Let's make sure you don't spend any more money than you have to spend on this car. And then try to get the paperwork. Pull the car up by the vehicle identification number and find out what the original MSRP was and then work the numbers from the original MSRP. Obviously, you know what their lease payment was. If their lease payment was $299 a month, and you know the car sold for $44,000, you could simply do a, a real quick math, uh, a finance overview, and say your payment would have been $575 a month at that current rate back then. Um, you pay $299 a month and everything. Are you sure you want to finance a car at this time? So use the math skills that were given to help the customer out because a lot of times they didn't understand the lease so much that they just want to walk away from it this time because financially maybe they're in a better situation this time. People who talk about driving too many miles. Well, I'm going to tell you the easiest way to answer that. If I'm going to drive high miles, there's two courses of action. I can buy my miles up front. Miles on a TFS lease cost you 15 cents a mile if you exceed the miles based on the parameter of the lease. So it's pretty easy if you drive an extra 10,000 miles, you multiply that times 15 cents and you know exactly what your mileage penalty is. If you buy your miles up front because you know you're going to drive extra miles, then you're buying those miles up front at 10 cents a mile. So everybody watching this video right now knows that you can prevent a cost of 5 cents a mile by buying your miles up front. The problem is if you, don't, if you buy those miles up front and you don't use them, then that causes a little inequity. But by buying your miles up front, you change the residual on a lease, so you lower the overall residual. So at the end, if you wanted to buy the car, you could buy the car at the lower residual. So you can recoup some of your money in any situation, no matter whether you turn the car back in or you complete the purchase of the car. So I don't know. 
I don't know that I'd ever buy the miles up front, and I'll tell you why. Paying to you know tomorrow's expenses with today's dollars doesn't make sense since we know interest rates are trending up. So, so why would you buy why would you buy your miles up front when you know you can defer your miles to the end, utilizing the money that's that you're going to save by leasing a car. So let's just say right now it's $100 a month, the $3,600 that you've netted you didn't spend on the car, you can always apply that to a mileage penalty. If your mileage penalty was $1,500, you spent $3,600 less, you take the 15 out of the 36, you still benefit to leasing a car. So I'm not talking about a monthly payment as the number one source. The number one source of a lease to me is, is I know where I am. If the guaranteed future value or the residual of the car, if I'm buying a car or leasing a car for $30,000, and let's say the vehicle has maintained its value at $18,000 on the residual, then I know at the end of the three years or whatever term that I go that there's a value established of the car. If the car is selling the open market for $21,000, then I can buy the car back from the bank at eighteen. dollars I can sell it to my next door neighbor for twenty dollars dollars um, net of the taxes, um, I'm, you know, I, I get to put that money in my pocket. That's my money. And I can make a decision at the end of the lease to go ahead and purchase and resell the car if I want to do that. Um, it's a hassle. But I can, if I'm going to make that money, I might as well make the money. If for some reason the car went the other way, let's say three years from now, cars drive themselves. You know, technology is just one click away from everything changing. I mean, I can give you examples. The airbag came out. Um, even though the original airbags in some of the manufacturers were the worst thing you could ever have on the car, they didn't work, they injured people. But once people said, I have to have an airbag, then cars without an airbag went down in value. We had cars out there getting eight miles per gallon. They were fun to drive, but when gas went to $4 a gallon, those cars weren't worth what they used to be. I mean, nobody wanted a car that got eight miles per gallon because it cost too much to fill the car up. So things change in the economy that change the value of a car. The nice thing about a lease is I've established the value of the car. An example was 18000 And if the car's selling in the open market for 15000 then I can turn the car in and walk away from the negative equity. Think about how many people you deal with on an everyday basis that are upside down in their car deal. There's a lot of things that create that. Um, I was upside down when I traded, and I rolled my negative equity into a car note. Then you're probably going to be upside down no matter how good the car is because you're financing the car that you purchased, a little bit of the car that you traded in, and taxes and fees. I mean, how would you ever catch that? People do that all the time. If you would have leased the same car and rolled the negative equity into the lease, at the end of the term, you're net. So the negative equity that you occurred in this car note, if you would have leased the car, would have been gone, and the payment would have been lower. So now I've, I've, I've reduced my negative equity. I keep that money. My payment was lower. I keep that money. Stop me when this sounds like a terrible way uh, to be able to get a new car. Where in terror penalties, people are always worried about that. You know, I live in the South. There's a lot of trucks purchased here. And people use trucks as trucks down here. They find a dirt road. They say, let's go on the dirt road. They go fishing. They go camping. They load uh, way too much stuff in, in, the, in the back of a truck. You know, somebody asked me what the payload of a truck was. And, I mean, definitely in the South, the payload is whatever you can get in the back of the truck and make one trip with. And people overload their trucks. When the truck comes back in, it's got tailgate damage. It's got maybe, you know, bumper damage. And the used car manager is going to decrease the value of the car based upon the damage of the car or truck. And they're, they're going to say, okay, I need to replace all this stuff. It comes up to $1,500. The value of the truck was X minus $1,500. That's where your value is. And they present that to the customer just straight up. This is how much damage is on the vehicle. Here's what your vehicle would have been worth net of the damage. So here's where your new number is. Nobody argues with that number. It's physical damage of the vehicle. If you know that you're going to damage your vehicle, you know it. You're buying a truck to use as a truck. You're buying a 4Runner to take off-road. Then buy a $695 wear and tear policy with your lease. That covers you to $5,000 worth of wear and tear. 
So if you bring a vehicle in that's got $3,500 worth of wear and tear, your policy pays for that. So let me walk through this one more time because this gets stupid. My payment is lower by $100 a month. I have $3,600 that I've got in my hand. I take some of that $3,600 that I know I'm going to have because my payment's $100 lower and I buy a $695 wear and tear policy. So $3,600 minus $700, you see the math. Still $2,900 better off. At the end of the term, the used car manager would have slammed my car for $3,000 worth of damage on the car because there's $3,000 worth of damage on the car. The wear and tear policy nets that out. You don't spend anything. So the $2,900 net of the wear and tear policy you still have and you're not penalized for the $3,000 worth of damage. If you would have financed the car, you would probably be upside down. So you don't have the $3,600 net of the $700, that's $2,900. Now you're upside down by a couple of grand, plus the $1,500 to $3,000 worth of damage that's on your vehicle. And all of a sudden, you're, you're $6,000, $5,000, $7,000 upside down. You see it every day. So look at the situation of the buyer. Look at the condition of the vehicle they're trading in. Look at how many miles on the vehicle. When that customer says, I'm going to buy this vehicle and it's the last vehicle that I'm ever going to own, look at their credit application and realize that once you pull the bureau, they trade cars every three years. Explain to the customer, because you've built that trust with them, that you really know what you're doing. If we can save you thousands of dollars, why wouldn't you consider a different way to get the vehicle? The only other objection you'll have with this, and, and, I, and I could go on for hours talking about the benefits of money, but the only other objection you're going to get is, you know, really, I want to own this vehicle. Well, the only way to prove that source is the way I do it in my leasing class. I take a vehicle and I lease it. At the end, you've got the residual of the guaranteed future value. You can buy that vehicle for that value plus the sales tax in your state, and then you own that vehicle. So it's the term of the payments plus what it costs you to buy the car at residual. If you add those together, it's not even fancy math. If you add those together, then you know the net overall purchase of that vehicle. Or you could take a 3.9% interest at the selling price of the car plus taxes and fees, and you multiply that all out. At the end, you come out with total amount of cost that it takes you to buy the vehicle over 60, 72, or 84 months. If you compare these two numbers, then you'll know exactly what it costs you to complete the purchase. But let me go back. On a regular finance contract, if at any time you want to trade that vehicle in and the market's walked away from the vehicle, there's autonomous vehicles out there that drive themselves right now. Cars get 100 miles per gallon right now. Uh, new hybrid technology is is uh, changed the, you know, how much money we're spending in fossil fuels. We've got America right now saying we want to get rid of fossil fuels, so a fossil fuel car, if we get rid of fossil fuel cars, is worth nothing. So all of that is a risk. But I can own this car. Over here, I lease the car for 36 months. Call it a test drive. You can make up any word you want. So for the first three years, I'm going to drive the car, and it's going to cost me X amount of money. Here's my protection. I bought a wear and tear policy. Um, I paid a little bit extra, and I bought my miles up, so I have to worry about my miles if that's important to you. And here's exactly how much I'm going to drive the car. At the end of the three years, you sit back down with my sales professional and my management team at my Toyota store. And we mathematically look at which way is the best way for you to go forward. Do you love your 4Runner? Do you want to keep your 4Runner? You got 45,000 miles on the vehicle. You're starting to get some miles on there. There's some wear and tear going on there. You need to do major services on the car. Tires need to be replaced. Brakes need to be replaced. And you got to calculate all, all the things that you have to spend to be a used car owner. You have to calculate that in because it's all math. I'll promise you one thing. If you get a client base that depends on you to lay every single thing out so that they, they net value back by doing business with you, by doing business with you, 
When they come to you as the source of, you know, let me say which way do I want to go. This new hybrid Avalon looks like a perfect vehicle for the way we drive. What is going to be my overall best way to be able to put that in my driveway um, outside my house or in my garage? Is the hybrid technology going to change in three years? You know, what's your answer going to be to that? I'll tell you that we're spending billions of dollars in research. We're trying to put a vehicle on the moon. Um, there is a great chance that what you're buying today might not be the best overall technology in three years. Tell the truth. Manage your customer's money. Think about this. I mean, if you count, if you count a house, not everybody owns a home, but the next biggest purchase of your life, dollar-wise, is going to be a car. The better, the better overall you get at your job, the more money you make, the more expensive a car you buy. Our used trucks right now are $50,000. You know, Sequoias now are over $70,000. Um, we need to raise the level of our ability with the customer. You know, you got your insurance agent selling somebody annuities, you know, for their retirement. Well, that insurance agent isn't near as good at their job as you are at your job. So I started looking at this as protecting my customer's money in the future and becoming a client because I know how to be able to take care of their money. It's a next level in the evolution of being a car sales professional. We have so many people that come in this industry and they're here for six months and they're gone. If you come in this industry and you learn what the clients need, if you learn to be able to put a client base together, you'll still be here in six months. You'll still be here 30 years from now because it's always good to know somebody in the car business. You guys know how many calls I get a year. Hey, KC, can you help me get a Toyota? They don't want to come to the dealership because they don't know what they're getting into. But if you're there and you become their car professional, then there's no need for them to call me anymore because they know they're going to get taken care of long term. I know this has kind of been a ramble, but it's interesting when you see things coming back again. As cost of money goes up, to, you know, right now the United States is, is rolling pretty good. I mean, there, it could always be better. People could always make more money. There could always be a better job. Um, you know, cost of things could always go down. I mean, I understand that nothing's perfect. But right now, if you want a job, you can get a job. You know, I told somebody the other day, they're going, I'm having a hard time finding a job. I said, they're hiring it at the Toyota dealerships right now. Um, you know, I heard her on the news the other day, Border Patrol needs another thousand people. There's jobs. So there's jobs right now, and the money's flowing again right now. That increases the cost of goods. Take a few minutes, review the three-part series that I put on YouTube on leasing, and I broke it down to the simplest features to future values of the cars and how you can explain that to the customer. Maybe I'll replay those in the next few weeks on YouTube because it's been a little while since I've done that. It's always good to sit down and talk to you guys about future. I realized you're trying to close a month out right now and that's super important every month how you close your month out. But which way is the industry growing and, and, and going? Growing and going, let me say both. And are you prepared for any nuances or changes in the industry? Because the people out there that are ready for the changes become the best asset for the customers. PK52, the Saturday morning meeting.